All right, good evening, everybody. So tonight we're going to be covering the solemnity of the body and blood of Christ, so Corpus Christi Sunday. So if you would, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Lord, watch over us by day and by night in the midst of life's countless changes. Strengthen us with your ever, never changing love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. And uh, I think it's kind of interesting that that the prayer, even though it's the prayer for Wednesday evening, the liturgy of the hours, he mentions uh, the whoever wrote the prayer way, way back when, that we are calling for God to strengthen us in his never changing love. And I think as we go through the readings, you'll really get a sense of that that idea right um and i think i think the other part of it is you really get a sense of eternity right you really you're, you're gonna really get a sense of what we are moving towards okay so like i said the readings i just put them up um so we will go ahead and get started and uh um, tonight i'm going to do old testament gospel then go to the new testament so the first reading from Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy, just to give you a little background, Deuteronomy, one of the five books of Moses, so the Pentateuch. But um, Deuteronomy is talking about things right before Moses dies. Okay. Um, it is right before they enter into the promised land. Because remember, Moses and the generation that were freed from Egypt, um, because of their constant lack of faithfulness, God said that no one from that generation would enter into the promised land, but rather it would be the next generation. So children that were born during the uh, during the the wandering in the Sinai Peninsula, those would be the people that would enter into the promised land. Um, so Moses is kind of giving them these, these these last sets of teachings and these last speeches before Joshua goes into the promised land and Moses passes away. So Moses said to the people, remember how for 40 years now, the Lord your God has directed all your journeying in the desert so as to test you by affliction and find out whether or not it was your intention to keep his commandments. He therefore let you be afflicted with hunger and then fed you with manna, a food unknown to you and your fathers, in order to show you that not by bread alone does one live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. Do not forget the Lord your God. I do want you to notice, I don't know if you're looking at the readings right now, so that first section that I just read, that's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, and then it jumps to verses 14 to 16. So if you're wondering why this, okay. Do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery, who guided you through the vast and terrible desert with his seraph serpents and scorpions, its parched and waterless ground, who brought forth water for you from the flinty rock, and fed you in the desert with manna, a food unknown to your father. So he's reiterating what we heard in the in verses two and three there. So I just want to get into a little bit. So scholars, you know, scholars, preachers, teachers, whoever else have uh, for a long time, you know, sometimes get into the debates of, well, what was the manna? Was the manna something that was more or less a, a naturally occurring thing. What does it mean that God gave them the manna? Who knows? And it doesn't matter. That's not the, that's not the point. What the manna actually was, what it tasted like, what it looked like, that that's, doesn't matter. What matters is that what Moses is trying to get them to understand is when they were hungry, God fed them. Okay, when they could no longer feed themselves under their own power, by their own work, by their own ingenuity, 
um, God, so that God fed them. So that's when he says as to, he has directed your journeying in the desert. So as to test you by affliction to find out whether or not it was your intention to keep his commandments. And I think, you know, a lot of times until we face some sort of affliction, it's very difficult for us to really know how we're going to react. Right. And so the idea is that what Moses is saying is God didn't let you suffer because he doesn't like you because he hates you. God didn't let you suffer because he's cruel, cruel. God didn't let you suffer because he couldn't stop the suffering. God let you be afflicted because it is in the affliction that we come to find out where our faith really lies. Um, do we really have faith in God? Do we really believe in the promises of Christ or do we not? Um, do we really believe that God will come through when, when we need him to and that God, that all things will work together for the glory of God? Do we do we really believe that even when it doesn't necessarily seem that way? OK. Um, and then he says, he therefore let you be afflicted with hunger and then fed you with manna, a food unknown to you and your fathers. And of course, the point of that is that God is showing them that not only does he feed them, but he feeds them in a way that there is no mistake. That the food is coming from him. OK, that there is no, oh, well, maybe God gave us the manna or maybe it was here all along or maybe it was, um, you know, maybe it's something that happens every year at this time, you know, or something like that. No, that that's not it. But God that God provided them with this food that they did not recognize their fathers did not recognize that no one had ever eaten before. But he says, want, but, but God promised that he would do that. See, so the next sentence, in order to show you that not by bread alone does one live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So it's not just that they're being fed the manna, but it's that God, through his promise, gave them the manna. So it's really, it is God's word that is feeding them the manna is just the manifestation in that sense of God's word. And so that, that's what Moses is, is getting at here. And then he goes and he reminds them, uh, do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, right? That we've been wandering around here for 40 years and many of the people who were, who actually were uh, old enough to remember being slaves in Egypt, many of them have now have now passed away. So the a, a lot of the younger people are not going to have uh, any memory. Some of them may have no memory because they, they may have been born during the time they were on the peninsula. <clears throat> um, because remember, if they've been born, if, if they've been on the peninsula for 40 years, you know, someone that was born would be, you know, they could be 40 years old. Um, okay, so... So he's reminding them that it was God who brought them out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, because many of them don't remember it because they weren't they weren't even alive when it happened. Or maybe if they were, they were very young children when it happened. And he says, who guided you through the vast and terrible. And he, and he talks about all the things in the desert that were anti-life, right? The serpents, the scorpions, the parched and waterless ground. But yet God brought water forth from the rock when Moses struck it with his staff and fed you with manna. So again, even though we were in this terrible place, God made sure that we had what we needed to make it to the promised land. But the big, the big kicker is we cannot forget why we are here in the first place because God rescued us from slavery and brought us here. And the only reason we are wandering around is because of our infidelity to God. All right. <clears throat> Questions, comments, thoughts. All right. Well, now I'm going to connect this 
with the gospel. And I, I'm, I'm sure it will be a pretty easy connection for you. I don't think anybody's going to struggle with the, with connecting the readings tonight. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, specifically, keep that in mind. Jesus is specifically here talking to the Jewish crowds. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. That is a reference to the manna in the desert. So speaking to the Jewish crowd, saying that he is the bread come down from heaven, all of them would have said he's talking about manna. Is he saying that he's manna or is he comparing himself to the manna that God gave our ancestors? So Jesus is connecting himself not only to the manna that God provided, but when this is John's gospel, when John in his prologue talks about Jesus being the word and the word, the logos of God, well, we go back to Deuteronomy that Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So in that, when Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven, he is saying he is the manna. He is the word of God. Okay. And then he says, different than Moses, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Okay, so now, now he's changing things. So keep in mind that, so the Jews are very familiar with the story of Moses. They are in, they are in slavery. God sends a person to them, right? Who attests to the reality, Moses. God sends Moses to the Jews. Moses attests to the power and the reality of the Jewish God through signs and wonders, right, performed publicly. We see this in the plagues. Um, and then for those who are willing, Moses offers them a baptism, which would be the Passover meal and the, the, the sprinkling of the lamb's blood on the doorpost. And then they are now led out of slavery into freedom through what? Through the waters of the Red Sea. So baptism. Okay. So Jesus is, is saying, if he is this bread, if he is this, he is the new Moses. He is the, he, and he is also the bread come from heaven. He has, he is a person appointed by God to do signs and wonders to help people to to show them the reality of God the Father and by if and and believing in him a person is then baptized and then they are led out of slavery which is a, a sin original sin specifically and but where are they led they're not led straight to heaven but they're led onto the onto the peninsula into the wilderness and so this is kind of like this is this is the life this is the christian life the jewish life we are led out of that slavery of original sin but yet we still have to wander for a generation on this desert right where we are going to be afflicted so that god can solidify our faith but even though we are afflicted god is still going to give us bread from heaven and Jesus says that bread from heaven is himself. Okay. And you, and, and, and just before, you know, if somebody ever says, well, would you, Jesus is speaking symbolically because obviously this is the feast of Corpus Christi. It's the feast of the body and blood of Christ. So as Catholics, we, we believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. Um, you look at the next sentence and the Jews quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So however Jesus said this to them, whether in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever language he spoke this to them, there was no confusion among the Jews that heard him that he was speaking literally that they, they didn't say, Oh, that's a great analogy, Jesus. 
oh, that that's a neat way you said that. That's a great, that's a very apt metaphor for the spiritual life. No, their response was, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Right? Um, so they took him literally. Uh, and whatever he said was very upsetting. Uh, it, we don't we don't have it in uh, in this reading, but again, I, I do think it's interesting that John chapter six, verse sixty six, so six six six, right? John chapter six, verse sixty six says it's the 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 teaching is too hard, and many people left him. Many people no longer followed him, depending on the translation. Um, but so again, Jesus didn't go chasing after them saying, let me clarify. I was only speaking metaphorically. His response was he turned to the apostles and says, will you leave me too? Right. Um, okay. So getting, getting that out of the way, Jesus does not mean this symbolically. Then Jesus continues. Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true, is true drink. Um, I do want to just kind of stop there. So it says, I will... Uh, has eternal life and i will raise him on the last day this going back to deuteronomy this would be like that moment where god has been feeding them with the manna in the desert and now having been fed for the with food for the journey that is bread from heaven they are now the this gr the group in uh in deuteronomy they are now prepared to pass over into the promised land and once they cross over once they leave the wilderness and go into the promised land there's no more manna because they don't need it because the journey is complete right their time of wandering in the wilderness is over um they are now entering the promised land so now this the idea is that god is going to be all in all same with us god in Christ, in the body and blood of Christ, provides us with the Eucharist, which is the bread from heaven that we receive, the word of God that we receive, that is meant to give us food for our journey while we are in this life. And it prepares us and it feeds us and nourishes us so that when we get to the moment where we are going to cross over into the promised land, we are prepared, right? We have been prepared. We have been, we have faced affliction and found that our faith remains strong. Our faith remains solid, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that is, uh, so... And of course, then Jesus, my for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, meaning that it truly nourishes both spiritually and physically, just like the manna. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. We are literally taking God into ourselves and God is literally becoming part of us in the reception of the Eucharist. So now there has been an intermingling of the divine and the human, um, of our humanity, of our fallenness and God's perfection. Every time we receive the Eucharist, we are receiving Jesus, body, soul, and divinity. And that, that in that sacrament, Christ is being mingled with our own body in that, in that sense. And he says, just as the living father sent me and I have life because of the father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. So again, our true life, our eternal life, our spiritual life is given to us by Christ in the Eucharist. 
And we are being prepared for that eternal life in receiving that. This is the bread that came down from heaven. And then Jesus quantifies it, right? Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. So this is not bread. Jesus is not just offering you something to keep you from being hungry until it's time to eat again later, till dinner, right? Or till breakfast. But he's saying, no, the manna was a foretaste of the Eucharist. The manna was bread that satiated their physical hunger, but yet they ate it. They still had to eat it again the next day and the next day and the next day. And they still died, right? This was not the bread of life. It was a bread to sustain life. But Jesus is saying in the Eucharist, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And of course, he's speaking in the spirit that we are through receiving the Eucharist, we are opened into eternal life. Okay, any questions about that? Any comments about John? I really thought this was going to take a lot longer, so... Okay, well, are you guys ready to get into then Corinthians? So in 1 Corinthians, what we have is Paul reflecting on the gift of the Eucharist. This is also a really good reading. I like this reading because Paul is very plainly saying that there is a sense of a communal liturgical ritualistic whatever you want to call it we'll say we'll say liturgical there is a communal liturgical sacramental sense of the breaking of the bread that is the eucharist of the participation in the blood of christ and the body of christ right that is already because if you look at what paul says he's not saying hey you need to start doing this. The way he's talking about this, it is it is a practice that is already in existence. He's just reminding them of what this means to their community, to the Corinthians. So, so when people say, oh, the Eucharist is an invention of the church later, here you have Paul talking about the Eucharistic, um, the Eucharist, the, the sacramental and liturgical blessing breaking and distributing of of the eucharistic species that is the body and the blood the bread and the wine so paul says brothers and sisters the cup of blessing that we bless so there you go liturgy right ritual that the cup of blessing which we bless that is, that, that 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 there is already a ritualized form of how the wine that will become the blood of Christ is blessed and that someone is doing the blessing. It is a prayer. It is a consecration. He says, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And of course, these are rhetorical questions because he wants to say, uh, you know that they are. Again, he's not trying to convince them that they are. He's not trying to introduce a new idea. Paul is saying, you know that this is true, okay? And you know this is why we do this. He says, because the loaf of bread is one, we, though many, are one body, for we all partake in the one loaf. Well, obviously, they're using a different loaf of bread at every liturgy. So when he says the loaf of bread is one, he means the bread that is the body of Christ, not the literal loaf. Although the loaf is what is blessed, broken, and then distributed from the singular loaf, but expanded out, it is all one loaf. And because in remembrance of Christ, we are all joined in the Jewish sense, joined into that one last supper that one eucharistic meal that is the eternal 
Eucharist, right? So even though we have our consecrated host and St. Clair's has their consecrated host, St. Paul has their consecrated host, they are all consecrated into the one host that is Christ. So we we all partake many parts of one body. We and, and though we again are many people, we all partake of that one loaf that is the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Okay, any questions? Uh, Go ahead, Vance. So back to the first reading. I'm trying to conceptualize this. That, so many of these people going on this four-year journey weren't even alive during the time of the slavery in Egypt, right? Right, right. Okay. So why are they going through the affliction? Because the Jewish sense was that the sins of the father was going to be visited on many generations beyond. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and, and of course, I mean, if you think about it from uh, just from like a, a biological, I guess, for lack of a better term, a biological standpoint, you know, <clears throat> if somebody is, I'm going to say, somebody is 40 or 50 years old when Moses leads them out of Egypt. That person has likely not going to have any more children in the wilderness, but they might have children that are, if they're 40 or 50, they might have children that are 20, maybe even 25, 30, you know, that are, that are, that are coming out of slavery with them. Um, and if they and, and they might even have children, they may not even have grandchildren, but they would be very young. So when you get into the wilderness, even though you have the generation, the leadership that makes the golden calf and doesn't keep their faith and breaks the Ten Commandments, all of these other things, you have all these other generations under them that still have to suffer the punishment that was brought on by this generation, even though they didn't do it, they were still there. And all this time, they're having children, people are getting older, new children are coming, people are passing away, all of this stuff. So even though there is a generation that has to pass away, it's not like, I mean, obviously, you guys all know this. I'm just, I'm, I, I know, you, I know, I know, you know this, I'm just saying it. Um, you know, it's not like, okay, everybody over a certain age is no longer here. Now, these people, you know, everybody's not having children at the same time. Uh, not all, you know, you don't have lines. And so I, so I think that's, is that kind of what you're getting at? Well, I was just trying to make sense of how this affliction should be upon everybody. Oh, okay, okay. And I guess it's like the things we learn from our parents we yeah. continue to do, sort of like you mentioned. So in that regard, it makes sense to me that that's yeah. why they would all face that trial. So, and, and, I, and I would say that that to me is the best explanation is you know we unless we break that cycle right we tend to a lot of times you know we learn these things from our parents and if we don't break the cycle a lot of times we continue on in the same path as our parents did who are continuing on in the path that their parents did um and at some point somebody has to say okay enough is enough we're doing we're, we're doing this now right um, and, and it happens in every family. It does. It happens in every family. I mean, I can, I, I can, if I think about it, in my own family, not, not necessarily in a bad way, but it's like, you know, my, my parents' family for multiple generations going back were all Methodist. But then when I became Catholic, I broke that tradition. I broke that with my family. And now from me down my children are Catholic and presumably my grandchildren will be Catholic. And now, you know, now that has been introduced into the family. Um, but sinfulness works the same way uh, or can. So uh, uh, that answer your question or that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else? Any, any other questions? Any other thoughts or comments? Um, 
if you're thinking of something, I do want to say, you know, I do think it's, it's very, these are very powerful readings and should give us a lot of reflection on the Eucharist and how we understand the place of the Eucharist in our lives um, and what it means to us. And I also want to point out that um, I don't know if it's the U S bishops or if it was, goes all the way up to Pope Francis, but there's, there's something that the church is getting ready to start moving into, which is going to be a period of what the bishops are calling Eucharistic revival, uh, which is, a, 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 and it's a, a big push to, to help people reimagine and, and, and come back to that understanding and love of the Eucharist. Go ahead, Bob, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say something that I remember reading somewhere or hearing somewhere that the early church, when they were persecuting the early Christians, one of the reasons that they were doing that is they said they're cannibals. Yes. Yes. Good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so even the people that were against the church did not say, oh, he's only speaking symbolically. They, they took the teaching literally. Um, or, or they were just being jerks. <laughs> so, um, but, but, but the idea is they, they thought that this new cult, right, the cult of the Christ, were literally eating the body and blood of, of their founder or their priest or their bishop or whatever they were calling the person. They thought that this was really some, some and they tried to, yes, the Roman government, people within the Roman government tried to accuse them of um, cannibalism. And that was one of the things, one of the reasons for or it was it was an excuse for a person because obviously they could have just gone to anyone that was Christian and asked them and they would have gotten an answer. But it's easier just to use that as an as, as an excuse to persecute. Uh, anyone else? OK, well, as we go into, um, you know, getting back into ordinary time, right? We're going to start. Uh, I know we've been back in ordinary time, but this is the last major Sunday feast, right? And as we get, so next week will be the 11th Sunday in ordinary time, right? We're back into sun, ordinary time Sundays. Uh, I'm hoping that this kind of inspires us to really um, not take for granted what Christ gives us week after week even day after day uh to receive him in this in this way and how important that is and how miraculous that is uh and and it is true i know i i got out of the habit with covid but before covid i was really good about going to daily mass you know i even scheduled all my classes here to make sure that nothing happened before daily mass was over um but you know, and with COVID, I got out of the habit and I keep saying, what's going to push me to get back into it? And I, and I hope this will, um, I hope, cause I think we have daily mass here tomorrow, right. Um, on Thursday. So, you know, good, good opportunity to say, okay, get back on the horse, you know, and, and start going back because even though we're not required to go to daily mass, if we have the opportunity, uh, it certainly is not going to hurt us and it's only going to help us spiritually to experience, to, to, to receive Christ more as often as we can. And Jesus did say, do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. So, so anyway, okay. Uh, anything else? All right, you guys, 34 minutes. Okay. Well, I, I, I figured, I, I kind of imagine there were going to be a lot of questions, but, um, I guess we're all so used to the Eucharist. It's, it's, um, sometimes we just need reminding. Okay, so, all right, well, good deal. Well, I will see you all next week, and I hope you have a good week. So we'll go ahead and close in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All right, good night, everyone, and I will see Amen. you next week.